So Robert Cherry, he's a professor emeritus um, from Brooklyn College. He taught there for 45 years um, and he retired two years ago. And in his time there, he's published, he's made um, a lot of his writings, his um, included areas of social policy, social inequality, race relations, racial disparities, um, issues of poverty I, I saw as well. And um, you've written a number of books as well, um, one entitled Who Gets the Jobs, which explores um, race dis um, discrimination with race and gender in the workforce. So it's, it's a privilege and I'm, I'm grateful that you could come on today and have this conversation with me. So welcome. <laughs> So, well, and thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Today we'll be exploring your latest essay. And um, what I found when I read this essay is the main idea, I'm sure you will, you know, say, tell it better than me what, what the main ideas of this essay is. But I found the main idea to be how um, certain groups, especially in, in the United States, they, they seem to be unable to participate in, let's say, the American dream because they're, they, they're blindsided or they're blinded by this rhetoric of, of white supremacist thinking. But yet, at the same time, you have many groups, many immigrant groups who seem to be taking advantage of this same system and carving out quite a meaningful and successful life for themselves. The same system that seems to be so, you know, to be such an unbreakable barrier to some other people. So before you talk about your essay, please just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, as you mentioned, uh, I started teaching maybe 50 years ago and I'm sort of a product of the 60s. And uh, I started out very far on the left. I uh, was a member of a Leninist party for maybe 20 years up and through up through the early 1990s. And we saw black workers as the vanguard of revolutionary change. And uh, my academic career was uh, and still is dominated by understanding the situation of black Americans and what can move them forward. Uh, I've just completed a manuscript that'll be published in late summer uh, that, that looks specifically at the kinds of policies, housing policies, labor policies, family policies that can uh, transform uh, black communities and particularly the youth that live in them. So you mentioned that you used to be part of um, a Leninist party, if I can say. Um, should I presume that you no longer hold those views? Could you talk me through your political journey and how, because you're saying the same thing, right? You're still concerned, if I can use that word, about, let's say, the plight of Black Americans. So how has your political journey been until this point? And what has been your, if I can say, main points of influence to, to lead you to this shift in, in perspective? Well, the main kind of shift is... Even when I was in this Leninist organization, uh, the Progressive Labor Party, uh, I was still focused on meaningful reforms. I mean, part of what always created attention with me is that so-called revolutionary parties uh, look past reforms. They're uh, ambivalent and not antagonistic to reforms because you know they ameliorate the system and they take away revolutionary fervor, et cetera. And so when I act, broke with them, I, it was really over reforms, finding reforms that could work uh, and maybe people thought that they're too little, et cetera. 
I still have that view, but the Democratic Party in the United States has certainly moved away from that. How and it's been particularly since Obama. Obama was really a third way Democrat. Uh, and, you know, so in this book that I've completed, there's a good deal of policies that are quite consistent with what Obama 10 or 15 years ago promoted. Uh, but they have no standing in the Democratic Party anymore. Right, I see. And the title of this latest essay that I referenced um you mentioned that white supremacist thinking is blinding um, a lot of groups, but not in the way that the main narrative um, proposes. What What is your own personal views about such concepts like white supremacy and systemic racism? And how much of a player do you think these are in the state of, let's say, um, minority yeah. groups in the USA? In my younger days, in the 60s and 70s, there certainly was white supremacist barriers to black advancement, whether it's in the labor market, housing, you name it, healthcare, there were very clear barriers, and not simply in the South where there were the vestiges of Jim Crow, but in the North as well. So, 50 years ago, these ideas made sense. But what has happened is that there have been meaningful reforms and that the vestiges of white supremacy have been marginalized by and large. Yes, there are pockets here and there, but they are have been pretty close to marginalized. And yet people look at these increasingly isolated examples as somehow a never-ending uh, stream of white supremacy. The examples they use are overwhelmingly from the past. When they look at today, like, for example, police killings of unarmed Black men. There's, in the last couple of years, there's been no more than 10 or 15 in the United States annually. And certainly a couple of them are pretty egregious, like Floyd killing. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about more, you know, a couple of handfuls when there are, you know, 8,000 black homicides a year in the U.S. And that because of the gun violence in black neighborhoods. And somehow these examples of black police killings are all you hear about, and uh, it's not helpful in looking at solving the gun violence that is uh, damaging black lives. Uh, and it doesn't matter what happened 50 years ago. So many people would say that it does matter. And they would say it matters because the effects still trickle down until today. And then they would say um, the effect of what happened, let's say 50, 60, what's happened for 400 years, you know, has meant things like wealth gaps, um, high poverty rates in, in many black communities. And they, they blame, let's say, such violence and crime and disorder on the poverty um, that they, they ascribe to historical events. Um, I was looking at South Africa's um, crime rates, um, especially in the black demographic groups, and it's it's really high. It's it's very very high. Um, I mean, they have a population of sixty million, sixty or so million, like the UK, and you know their their murdering rates are just oh you know very high. So when the their national crime center did um, a study on why such crime rates were so high they found that poverty was actually somewhere like fifth you know on on the list and they found things such as the normalization of crime you know the um you know 
um, family structure, corruption in the criminal justice system was ranked higher to why such crime rates, um, you know, remained. What do you think is causing such high crime rates apart from the obvious um, legacy of, of historical events? What else do you think could be at play here? Well, behavioral norms. I mean, what is acceptable behavioral norms has really, I think, been transformed. Uh, and, you know, this, this idea that because you're poor, we can understand why you have bad behavior. I mean, that becomes an excuse for not having personal responsibility. And I think one of the damages of the white supremacist notion is it takes away all agency. It says it doesn't matter what you do, you're in this white supremacist environment. And if you happen to engage in bad behavior, we understand it's because of the hopelessness of your situation. Uh, now you can overstate agency and how much individuals on their own can transform their situation. That there is a need, a significant need for support services to help people move forward. But they have to take agency. They have to see that they have the ability to move their lives forward. And yes, you will try to rely on certain services. It's great if you have mentoring, if you have a number of things, but, it's you, but without your initiative, it ain't happening. And so I think that that's, I mean, one of the things in, that's become so commonplace among democratic policies is they ask nothing in return. We'll give you money for childcare, we'll give you this for that, but they are explicit in that there, it, there are no contingencies. You don't have to be in work-related programs, you don't have to be in school, you don't have to do anything, we're giving you this money. And uh, yes, you, don't, you have to be careful of what you expect from people, but if you expect nothing, you end up in the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I think we've just gone overboard in looking at societal responsibility for everything and negating the possibility and the need for individual initiatives. I mean, after all, why are black 10 year old kids so far behind in the educational system. There are other poor, there's Latinos, there's a whole bunch of immigrant communities. And you don't see this kind of lagging of education. And these are in cities that have very high spending per capita on students. New York City, Chicago, Baltimore, Los Angeles, they are the highest expenditure cities per per pupil, and I mean, you have 11% of juniors in high school are on grade level. 11% of black high school are on grade level. You know, there's something going on besides white supremacy. Yes, and if I can just quote um, a part of, of your essay, actually the start, where you talk about the problem with this narrative of, of white supremacy. And you mention um, non-white immigrants, um, you know, gaining success, not, not just, you know, Chinese, but those from South Asia, um, Africa, the Caribbean, um, even some Latino groups. And you mentioned that these groups, especially these immigrant groups, they don't harbor this radical you know, view of, of on the nature of American society and, and how, it's make, how it's supposed to be so racist and intrinsically racist. And because of this, they sort of focus on 
their energy, if I can say, on different things. And I find it quite interesting because, you know, you know, we, we saw when, uh, you know, situations of Americans, not just black, actually, you know, white Americans burning flags, um, burning the flags. We saw we see people seeking to change national holidays in the U.S., national anthems. You know, where, whereas immigrants, you know, they're just kind of seeing the United States as a place where their dreams can come true. And in fact, for many immigrants, it's the last door for them. You know, in the UK, similarly, it's, you know, things are happening where during the BLM protests, you had a 19 year old boy um, burning our, the Union Jack, the British flag on the Whitehall Cenotaph. And the same mentality is here and it's people are burning flags, people are pulling down statues, people want to rewrite history, whereas those who come in from the outside don't care about the history, they care about the opportunities, you know, and they seem to be taking a bigger piece of, of this pie. So you mentioned sort of the lagging in the educational system, we spoke about crime. If many groups, let's be specific, if some black groups believe that this system is not for them, then why should they, if I can use this word, participate in the system? There's no incentive for them to do so. So how do we get any group that seems to think the system is against them? How do we get this mentality that, you know, there is a, there is a system, it's unfavorable to all apart from the select few. And instead of, you know, going against it instead of fighting against the system why not play by the rules to get where you need to get to and even change or influence the system in in some way or another i don't know if that makes sense but what is the most bizarre thing about this is this white supremacist viewpoint is not even held by the majority of black americans it is white liberals promoting this narrative. So for example, the fund the police, which they pushed, 80% of black Americans want more police than their neighbors, at least the same amount or more police. So uh, the school system, as I described, you know, why are there such problems? Black parents and Latinos as well, to an, a large extent, certainly a plurality, want charter schools. They want alternatives to the union run public schools in urban areas. That's not what, the, what these white liberals want. So you have, it's not that it is the black community that misunderstands the situation and what they need to get ahead, but it's their so-called leaders, these what's called, you know, these woke whites who are imposing their own value system on the people they're purportedly speaking for. So, you know, and it, it was pretty clear in New York City when there was this mayoralty election Adams, who won, got over 80% of the Black and Latino vote. There was another Black candidate, uh, Maya Wiley, who was for defund the police and all of this left stuff. She got almost no Black votes. So, so as I was saying about the new mayorality election, the woke candidate, this Black woman, Maya Wiley, got no black votes, you know, maybe 10 or 15% of the black vote, but she got all of these white liberals. So, you know, that's one of the more obscene things about the politics in the United States. Yes, you have a couple of black figureheads, you know, the, the usual suspects like Al Sharpton and others who are part of this so-called uh, anti-racist movement, the leaders of BLM, but you don't have rank and file blacks that are all part of it. And 
but these rank and file blacks by and large don't influence, let alone control public policies in the cities in which they live. So you have uh, an aggressive attempt to restrict the number of charter schools. You have these defund, defund the police movements that have been effective, not in so much the funding, but in leading police to be less proactive. You have retirements, you have dissolution among the police, and that sort of leaks into more crime occurring. Uh, what do you think about the police system though? Um, I presume you're not for, or I may be wrong, I may be presuming wrong, I presume you're not for the funding of the police, but what do you think of the police system and even the prison system when it comes to um, black people? Is there cause to want less police, even though I understand that generally people want more police? Um, but do you think that there could be... Um, changes or not just improvements you know in a broad sense but what what do you think can help the relationship between the police and the black community well there are two things one is getting a better understanding of the statistics there's too much of this you know, blacks are disproportionately this and blacks are disproportionately that with the police. But it's not so disproportionate if you compare it to crime rates. You know, so that if black commit violent crime at three times the rate of whites, why should one be surprised that there are more black engagements with police? And you know, so I think the disproportionality argument is tremendously, it leads to a distortion of understanding about why there's much more of an interaction between black residents and police. Now, in terms of the police behavior, I think that having cameras, and a number of other reforms have really lessened the excessives that go on. But, you know, there's this idealist idea that you're not, somehow you shouldn't have any mistakes, you know, zero tolerance. When, as you could see in New York with these two police killings, killings of police who are going for a domestic violence. Uh, situation, that they are in very complicated and dangerous situations, even when they are just doing something that isn't necessarily uh, an armed robbery in progress kind of situation. And even regular things like traffic stops have become very complicated because you have lots of people, lots of, not people, but black men who are out with criminal charges pending. You know, because of bail reform and a number of other things, there are all kinds of people who have been charged with all kinds of crimes who are on the street and don't show up for a hearing, don't show up for this. You know, they have outstanding warrants against them. And so there have been a number of these deadly police interactions at traffic stops because the person had these outstanding warrants. Uh, you know, that was the case in recently in Minnesota where an officer used by accident a gun. That guy had a number of outstanding warrants for, you know, for violent crime. So he wasn't about to be arrested by this 
for a traffic stop. It happened in Atlanta. There was someone who had an outstanding, he was going to be put back in jail because of uh, he had violated parole. So even though he, you know, he was just stopped for sleeping in a driving lane of a fast foods restaurant. Yeah. Once it became known, it became a violent interaction. Uh, so I'm obviously when there are excesses like Chauvin and George Floyd, you need to have it taken very seriously by uh, by the justice system. But you can overstate how many of those situations are. And, you know, we're not, you know, play, police are much more professionally trained than they've been. Uh, I did a study of three cities where it ended up there's really been transformations. The police that have been hired in the last half dozen years are not like the old fashioned police officers. And you can build community relations that can be effective. So I'm, you know, in this regard, I'm a half, half glass full kind of guy. And I see that many police departments want to build better relationships. They want to use social workers and others working in conjunction, not separate from the police. Uh, and these things should be supported. I feel that both sides have wrong perceptions of the other because I was watching how um, pol some police departments, more in the US, are trained to approach traffic stops now. Because like you mentioned, they're becoming, some of the most basic routines are becoming quite dangerous. And I, I heard that um, some of these police officers are being trained to go ready to almost have, you know, an altercation or, you know, you know an incident. And Vice versa, you have the rhetoric from the black community saying, well, if you encounter police, you can that could be your last day kind of thing. So I think working with social workers and so on is great. But this false perception and this, you know, overgeneralization based on specific incidents. And that's why I also think we should stop racializing events. As much as you've mentioned, for example, the Chauvin incident was horrific, but it didn't need to be racialized. There wasn't proof that it was a racial um, for, um, situation. And even proof of the fact is I think one of the other officer, I'm sure it was at least one of the other officer, wasn't white. I think he was of mixed ethnicity. So it wasn't a racially provoked situation. And I think we need to stop acting like... Same exact scenario of a knee on the neck killing someone was of a white defendant in Houston a year earlier. So I think you're right that we should separate out bad policing from the issue of race much more than we do. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, one is about the family. So you mentioned in your writing that um, many of the young black men and even white, white men as well who were unemployed, young men, you found that they were living with family members as opposed to parents. And I watched your talk with Glenn Lowry and you mentioned that you don't believe that just getting black people to get married or just getting, you know, people to get married will solve the problem. How do you reconcile having a structural family unit and not? Well, what I said, what I meant was that it's not realistic to expect marriage rates to go back to where they were. Uh, you know, there's a myth that somehow black, the lack of black marriage rates 
have something to do with the legacy of slavery. When you go, in the 1940s and 50s, black marriage rates were virtually the same as white marriage rates. It's really when you get to the late 60s and especially the 70s that you start to see a divergence between black and white marriage rates. But that's the reality that you're not, we live in a world where working class people, at least in the United States, whether they're white or black, working class kids aren't getting married. The professional class is, and having kids after marriage. But the working class, uh, certainly more among black than white, are not. And, you know, there are ways, I mean, certainly there should be more effort, particularly among adolescents, to promote traditional, what a so-called traditional success story. You finish school, you get a job, you get married, and then you have kids, right? That's the, <clears throat> that's what worked in the past. And it will work now, but it's not gonna happen overwhelmingly. Part of the reason in the black community is that you have a substantial share of young black men who are problematic. They're not in school, they're not at work, uh, maybe intermittently. And as long as you have this situation, I think there's 50% more black women who graduate college than black men. As long as you have these kinds of gaps, you, it's much more important to support relationships out of marriage, uh, cohabitation. It's much more important to give resources to black single mothers. I guess my last overall question, because um, you mentioned um, young black men you found lack the necessary behavioral skills. I'm not sure if it's in the book that I in your book where I read that some lack the soft skills for soft employment skills. for employment and you mentioned in your essay if social justice advocates support educational reforms that eliminate penalties for handing in assignments late you know in 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 the UK when the George Floyd protests happened many um university students black university students were excused from taking tests exams right so all these kind of initiatives and, and sort of movements by social justice advocates that in a way harm black people, harm the people who they, they hope to help. So I guess my question is, does the meritocratic system and further the capitalistic system help or harm black people as a whole? And if so, should we do away with it and find another way to equalize the scales if that could be said. Well, you know, loaded not, question, loaded question. Well, I know. Okay, because nobody realistically assumes there's going to be ch any change from the capitalist system. Uh, it's whether there'll be more supports, uh, sort of the European system of uh, tax policies, social welfare policies but nobody's getting rid of capitalism. What is really at issue, I think, is to what extent we continue with notions of merit. So what has another kind of dynamics that is unfortunate is while there's all this discussion about racism and its impact on the black working class, uh, particularly the poorer segments, the major initiatives with his energy behind is getting more blacks into uh, senior positions and in corporations, 
more tenured faculty at universities we're now gonna have with the Supreme Court. And I'm not saying any of that is necessarily bad, but it's the direction that this has taken where on the one hand, you point to the abuse that the black working class is getting, and then the policies that you have energy around are getting more black elites. So, you know, that's one thing. The other is just getting rid of merit. So you're not, you're not gonna have merit in the school system, in uh, specialized programs, in middle schools, in high schools, you know, that, you know, so, this idea of anti-capitalism is, I guess, should I say a red herring? Uh, it, it's just not at issue at all. Thank you so much, Professor Cherry, Mr. Cherry, Robert. It's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure and I've learned so much on this, com on this call. And I'm looking forward to your book um, that's coming in late summer. Um, can I ask the title or that's not public knowledge yet? Well, it hasn't been, I hesitate. I mean, the tentative title is Fragile Black Families Transforming Their Futures. Wow. Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> I'll be buying it here from London in the UK. Um, I'm looking forward to your other write-ins as well. So thank you so much um, for what you've done and what you continue to do. It's much needed in this space for true racial equality, for true progress in race relations in the US and in the US's baby brother, the UK. <laughs> well, thank you again. <laughs>